Hello, hello. Does anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Oh, all right. Okay, hang on. I can see you, and I think we can see you now. All right, okay. So uh, you guys should let me know when you want me to start. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I think this person is Oluwa Nifemi Lo. Yes. Thank you for joining our broadcast. Okay. So, yeah. I didn't, uh, I didn't need you. Is there going to be some kind of introduction before I shoot? Yes, sir. Okay, good evening, everyone. So, I'm Uluan. Today, for tonight, I'll be moderating. Our program. So before we start, can someone please pray for us? Do you mean someone should pray? Yes. Uh, huh? Okay. Um, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, our Lord, we thank you, we bless your holy name for who you are. We thank you for this privilege and another grace you have given unto us to be among the living soul, to come at your feet today and to listen to your doctrine, O oh Lord. But I accept our thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And Father, we pray that tonight you touch every of our souls and then Give us the more understanding to understand who you are, to learn about you, so that we cannot, we will not be able to depart away from you. I will pray that your spirit shall dwell more in us and our lecturer tonight to guide us into all truths in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, brother. So, Tonight, we'll be looking at the topic, the sovereignty of God and its implications in our lives. You must have heard of the word of, about the sovereignty of God in our sermons, Bible schools, Sunday schools, and the rest. And you must have had, had one knowledge or the other concerning it. So this evening, we are going to be considering that if God is sovereign, if he has the final say, or the final decision to make, then how does that affect us as an individual or as a Christian? So today we are going to be learning through our brother, whom the Lord I have prepared for us, our brother who is Mr. Deji. So in this moment, I'm calling him to take over, and I hope just to please pay attention and if you have questions, you should know today. So after the lecture, you send in the questions. Over to you, sir. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Sister uh, Nick Femi. I want to know whether the video is on recording because um, I have a channel on YouTube and I would like to have the video uh, subsequently broadcast on YouTube. So, Adeniji, is it being recorded right away? Yes, sir. It's being recorded, sir. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, I will just begin. Well, we have said a prayer, so we'll just continue our discussion. Let me put this up right away. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Theological Court for inviting me for this um, discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, 
I want to thank God for what the Lord is doing through you young people. I've been following your charts, and I saw one of the charts where an older man was uh, commenting and said that um, he appreciates God for what he's uh, what God is doing in your lives. And I also want to thank God for what he's doing. And um, if young people like yourself are interested in theology, you know, then we, we who are older can be confident that uh, perhaps when we leave this scene, uh, the gospel will not be in jeopardy. So I want to thank God so much for that. Okay, uh, like our like the introduction went, uh, today's topic we're going to be discussing about the sovereignty of God and its implication in our lives. But I actually uh, spoke to Brother Adeniji and I told him that it was too wide a topic for me to um, deal with, you know, because the sovereignty of God is actually a doctrine on its own and its implication is its application to our lives. So. I requested for me to have this lecture divided into two. Okay, so we're going to have one of the lecture taking place today and hopefully the second one going on tomorrow. Okay, another thing I want to plead with you is that I'm, uh, where I am, there's no power. So the light that is above me right now is actually powered by battery. I pray that it lasts long enough for the lecture to uh, go through. But my laptop is certainly not going to last that long. I don't, I don't think it will last that long. So uh, if I switch off uh, at some point, I'm going to request that you just hang on a little bit as I switch back to my phone so that uh, the lecture can continue. Okay, I hope that will not disturb the, uh, this coming, sorry, the recording at energy. I hope it wouldn't. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, all right, so uh, when, when I'm done now, I hope I can actually have time for comments and also have some of you uh, ask questions. Okay, we want to thank God for those who have been able to join and those who have not been able to join, I hope they get to see the recording. I pray that it will be a blessing to them. Okay, one of the things that I learned in my university days, I finished university in the year 2001, 2002, one of the things I learned was that there's nothing that is new that any of us is doing today. Um, there is uh, the university life or the life of the academics is uh, a life where you basically build on what others have done uh, before uh, you. Okay, so that's why you always have references. Uh, it's not expected that you do anything new. You actually do build on what others have done. Okay, I say all of this so as to say that I am um, committed, I am unapologetically um, a person who is um, committed to the Christian tradition that came from the 16th century reformation. Okay, and um, uh, some of us call ourselves reformed people, but um, I, I am committed to that you know uh, and it's not because uh, we don't believe the bible it's just that we believe that god did a work at that time in the 16th century that brought a resurgence a resurgence of scriptures a resurgence of 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 of, of, you know, of intellectual knowledge a resurgence of education generally you know and um, that's so I, i'm a reformed person and i learn from those people and the reformers themselves learned and took all of their traditions from the early church fathers and also from scripture. Okay, I say that because I need to say this, that uh, Martin Luther, the man who was at the center of the reformation was a man who taught a certain doctrine that was, I mean, a certain doctrine was central to his reformation. And that doctrine was justification by faith, justification by faith. It's impossible for me to go into all of that discussion now, if not, we will not finish. But Luther centered on justification by faith. On the other hand, a man called John Calvin, who was also a contemporary of his, but was much younger, centered on a doctrine called the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. It's not that Luther did not believe in the sovereignty of God, 
but both of them seem to kind of have a different emphasis. And it turns out that it is this sovereignty of God that you have asked me to come and discuss about. And I'm trusting the Lord that the Lord will help me to be able to do justice to this. Now, in theology, there's something we call the attributes of God. The attributes of God. And I'm very sure in theological courts, in your discussion back and forth, in your reading, you would have come across those. The attributes of God are essentially a description of who God is. A description of who God is. And you would agree with me that we need to know God. Why? Because Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, he said, the knowledge of God or knowing God is eternal life. Or knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent is eternal life. So knowing who God is and understanding who God is, is actually eternal life in itself. Amen. So the attributes of God is something that is very uh, central to Christianity because in appreciating the attributes of God, we come to know God. And in knowing God, of course, God's grace and his eternal life wells up within us. Okay, so there are some of these attributes I want to list up to us. I have it written here, okay? Uh, and then eventually I'm going to center on one central attribute, okay? The Bible teaches that God is light. The Bible teaches that God is the creator, okay? Much of the problems we're having in our world today and with the leftist agenda is that they reject God as creator. The Bible teaches that God is love. The Bible teaches that God is eternal, the Bible teaches that God is immortal. The Bible teaches that God is infinite. The Bible teaches that God is immutable. That is to say that God is unchanging. Okay. The Bible teaches that God is unfathomable. The Bible teaches that God is inscrutable, unsearchable. God is just. God is a God of justice. The Bible teaches that God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. The Bible teaches that God is one. The Bible teaches that God is righteous. God is holy. God is gracious. And by the grace of God, God is holy. He is righteous. He is gracious. Amen. All of these are attributes of God. And they are not limited to these alone. But these are just some of it. Okay. When we say that God is sovereign, we are actually talking about one attribute of God. The sovereignty of God is an attribute of God. It is an attribute of God. It's a description of who God is. It is thus the sovereignty of God that we wish to discuss about in this short talk. The sovereignty of God is what we want to discuss about. We want to examine it. We want to appreciate it. And by God's grace tomorrow, we want to apply it to our lives and see its various implication. At this moment, I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles, please open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 45. If you do not, I will ask for you to uh, just pay attention to, as I read, because I'm going to read quite a number of scriptures here. So please, I want to plead with you that you pay careful attention to, the, to them. In Isaiah 45, the Bible reads, and I quote from verse 5, Verse 5 reads, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will guard you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I, the Lord, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. I want to repeat verse 7 again. I, the Lord, form light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Verse 8. Rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Amen. Okay, verse 9. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the Prussians strive with the Prussians of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, He has 
no hands. Okay. In Isaiah 46, uh, verse 9 to 10, this a similar sentiment is reiterated. Verse 9. Remembering the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I will do all my pleasure as a sovereign God. My counsel shall stand. I create calamity. I create peace. I create light. I create darkness. I, the Lord, do all these things. In Proverbs chapter 16, that's uh, Proverbs chapter 16, we're still talking about the sovereignty of God. Verse 33. I'm going to read there. If I was in church, I would have asked somebody to read, but since we are not in church, verse 3. He who is slow, sorry, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lot, but its every decision is from the Lord. In Job chapter 42, in Job chapter 42, after Job had had this encounter with God and um, he has ceased to complain, the Bible says that God appeared to him and God had this to speak to him. In Job chapter 42, verse 2, let me start from verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Nothing. God does everything. God does everything. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we have a glimpse of, uh, a, a glimpse of the sovereign work of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God has a purpose. He has called men to be part of it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, we're still talking about the sovereignty of God. Verse 16 to 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principality or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Amen. So what I would have really wanted us to appreciate the most was actually at Isaiah 45, verse 7. The scripture says, God said, I create darkness and I create light. I create light, I create darkness. I create peace and I create Calamity. I, the Lord, I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay, so in seminary, and I understand that some of us are in seminary, you come across a course called Biblical Theology. And in Biblical Theology, they want you to appreciate the whole scope of the theology of the scriptures. They want you to understand what exactly is the scripture saying in one fell swoop. swoop. Okay, the doc of the sovereignty of God can help us to appreciate biblical theology better because we come to see that the whole working of scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of time to the end, is the outworking of God's will, is the outworking of God's purpose, is the outworking of God's desire. God is the one doing all these things. The sovereignty of God says that God is holy and totally in charge. God does everything. If something was going to happen tomorrow, God is in charge. God did it. God ensured that that thing happened for its own purpose. If Russia invaded Ukraine yesterday, God permitted it that way. God it was part of God's own working. Amen. So we later we'll come to appreciate what this sovereignty of God is. But please take note again of Isaiah 45 by 7. He said, if there's darkness somewhere, God created it. If there's light somewhere, God created it. If there's calamity somewhere, God created it. If there's peace somewhere, God created it. God is in charge of all things. All things in Jesus' name. Um, there is a document that proceeded from the 16th century reformation. 
uh, um, the, we, we call them the confessions. These confessions, excuse me, these confessions took different forms. In the days of John Calvin, and uh, in the days when it, the confession was enacted in the uh, Dutch land, that's in Netherlands or whole. Oh, sir, we can no longer hear you. Okay, because what happened was that a lot of French people could not practice their religion. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sorry. I think my network failed. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Okay, so uh, I, I'm not sure where I stopped. Yeah, I think you stopped at the Reformation, the 16th century Reformation, talking yes, about yes, the so From the 16th century Reformation, some documents proceeded. Okay, the churches in the Netherlands were using something called the Belgic Confession. They're using the Belgic Confession and the Helderberg Catechism. Okay, that's what they were using. Okay, but that document was modified a little bit so that in 1649, I believe, the Westminster's uh, confession, they, they modified it a little bit, and that's the confession that the uh, Reformed Presbyterians still use today in the Western world, okay? But in 1689, the uh, Baptist, uh, the Reformed Baptist, took that same Belgian confession, and that's the Westminster confession, and they made it into their 1689 confession. So what I'm going to read out to you right now is actually a belief that actually comes from the pen of men like Luther and men like John Calvin. It's something they held on to firmly, okay? It's something called God's decree, okay? If you look at the confession, if, you have, if any of you have the confessions, if you go to chapter 3, you come across something called God's decrees, okay? And in that part of the confession, I just want to read the first paragraph for you so that you can appreciate better this thing that we're talking about when we're talking about the sovereignty of God. So this is what the fathers said. God has decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things which shall ever come to pass. So God has decreed everything that would ever come to pass. And you would appreciate it better when you look at uh, the book of Isaiah, when God begins to say, call your idols. Let them tell you what is going to happen tomorrow. The reason why God is able to talk about what can happen tomorrow is because God himself decreed what will happen tomorrow. So let me take that paragraph again. God has decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably, all things which shall ever come to pass. Yet, in such a way that God is neither the author of sin, nor does he have fellowship with any in the committing of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather they are established. In all ways, God's wisdom is displayed, disposing all things, and also his power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Now, I'm going to accept that much of what I've read right now is big English. Okay? So, what I did now is just to summarize that paragraph into three points. Number one, what the fathers are saying is this. God has decreed all things that would ever happen. Everything that would ever happen God has decreed it. God did this within the confines of his sovereignty. So when we're talking about the sovereignty of God, we're talking about the fact that God has decreased it. Everything that is going to happen, good and bad, God is the one that said it will happen. 
Number two, even though God may have decreed all things to come to pass, yet God is not the author of evil. Okay, so while God has decreed everything that will ever come to pass, God is not the author of evil. In fact, the confession says that God does no violence to the will of man. Okay, we're still going to get to that point. How can God decree all things to come to pass and at the same time, he will not be the author of, the, of evil? We will see it in scripture by the grace of God. Number three, this confession is saying that God's wisdom is displayed in the light of his decree and his sovereignty. So God's wisdom is displayed in all of this. Amen. So I hope I have not given you too many information. So far, we have tried to uh, define what sovereignty of God is. And then I try to tell you that sovereignty of God is one of the attributes of God. Then we look at many scriptures where the Bible did talk about the sovereignty of God. Okay, And then I came to the confessions, the 1689 confession, which is also agreed to by the Westminster Confession, and the Belgian Confession, that about God's decree. And I summarize these decrees into the fact that God has decreed all things, number one, then God is not the author of evil, number two, and that God's wisdom is displayed in all of this. Now we come to this question, and I'm soon going to be rounding up in case you are getting tired of what I'm doing here. Okay, we get to this question. Why is God not the author of evil in spite of the fact that he has decreed all things. Why can why is God not the author of evil? I'm going to try to blow your mind with a concept which I just learned very recently. Very recently. So that one is new revelation. If I might speak like some of my charismatic friends. Okay. But I will still first of all state what I wrote down here, then I'll finish up with what I want to say. Okay. There's this concept in the scripture, in the Bible. I learned it for seminary, and uh, those of us who have gone to seminary, we always talk about seminary. If you have not been to seminary, please go to seminary so that you can talk like us. Okay? This concept is called divine concurrence. Concurrence. Divine concurrence. We know what concurrence is or concurrently. When we say something is running concurrently, that means they are running, they are working together. Okay? When we say something is divine, we know that it has to do with God. So there's such, it's such a concept called divine concurrence. Okay. And I saw it in scripture and it really blew, blew my mind. In fact, I was going to write, I think I was going to write my paper on the attributes of God, on the doctrine of God, where we learned about the attributes of God when I came across divine concurrence. And after I studied it, I wrote my paper on that. Okay, divine conference is beautiful. So at this moment, I want us to open our Bibles uh, to, we're going to look at two scriptures, uh, but there are three, but basically two scriptures. Let's look at Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. And um, if I forget to tell you this thing that I said I learned recently, which blew my mind, please remind me during the comments and questions. Okay, because I don't have it written here and I might just forget. Uh, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 to 21, jo um, Jacob had just died, and Joseph's brothers stopped that they needed to come and beg him. Listen to what happened, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus shall you say to Joseph, I beg you, please, forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sins, for they did evil to you. Now, please, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And listen to the divine concurrence here. Verse 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones, and he comforted them 
and spoke kindly to them. What is the divine concurrence there? It's simply this. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. While the brothers of Joseph sought to do evil to Joseph, while they were doing something evil against him, while they were doing something which God held against him and against them and which required their repentance, while they were doing that in one hand, in the same breath, God was using it all for good. In the same breath. So for those of you who probably know a little bit about mathematics, you see that while one thing was going up, its line was going up in one direction, this another line was going down in the same, I mean, in the different direction, but parallel to themselves. God was using that evil that they did against um, Jake, just Joseph for good. And if you look at the whole story, you almost say, ah, by all means, they should do that because that is the only means with which God was going to save Egypt from what was going to happen to them and with which God was even going to preserve a generation for Jacob. Okay, so the divine concurrence there is what? The fact that evil was being done, but God was using that evil for good. So why is God not the author of evil in spite of the, his decrees? It's simply this, that even within evil, even within evil, God's good, God's will is being worked out. That everything that is happening in our world, everything that is happening in our world is such a divine chemistry. It's such a coming together in a pot or a potpourri okay, of events in which God jams everything together to give us a wonderful, magnificent ma magnification of his counsel, of his glory, of his wisdom. Everything is being brought together. Everything, either good or bad, everything, God is using it to work out his counsel. And that's sovereignty. Sovereignty is simply saying that God is able to use everything he has decreed to come to pass for his will. But please take note of the fact that the person who did evil will the evil will still be held against him. Thank God, the, I mean the brothers of Joseph sought to be forgiven here. But there are many who wouldn't even seek forgiveness, and they will still stand before God and be judged for their sin, even though God will use that sin to bring about His ultimate purpose. Now, this is the second part. I want us to look at let's open our bibles to acts chapter 2 and see another wonderful outworking of the sovereignty of god in acts chapter 2 we will start to read from verse 22 but before i start to read from verse 22 do we realize that jesus christ born of a virgin mary born of the jew was actually somebody like a joseph do we realize that it was jesus's own brothers the Jews that took him and they crucified him. See what scripture says in uh, verse 22 of Acts chapter 22. And this Peter speaking after the day of, or during the day of Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourself already know, him being delivered. By the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. Please, did you see the concurrence there? Did you see the concurrence there? Verse 23. Jesus was delivered, delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was delivered to be crucified by the purpose and by the foreknowledge of God. By the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. But in the same breath, Jesus was taken by lawless hands and he was crucified and he was put to death. So in one hand, God was delivering his son to be crucified for the redemption of humanity. In the other hand, wicked men were crucifying Jesus. 
So that in one hand, the crucifixion of Jesus will bring redemption to sinners, but in the other hand, the wicked men who crucified Jesus will pay for their sins. In the same breath, in Acts chapter 4, verse 27 to 28, verse 27 to 28, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined beforehand. So Pilate and the Jews did nothing other than what God himself had purposed would happen. But God will hold the crucifixion of Christ against the Jews till today. God will hold the crucifixion of Christ against Pilate till today. Even though it was God's will being done. Divine concurrence. God is not the author of evil. Why? Because even though God decreed all of these things, God use, is using all of these things to bring his purpose to, to pass. He's using all of these things to bring his purpose to pass. So what do we see in this working of God's sovereignty? The working of God's sovereignty is simply this. God decrees. God says, this will happen. God says, this will happen. God says, this will happen. Okay? But again, God now take, uses means. He uses means to bring about those things to happen. So, God decreed that Joseph was going to preserve a lineage Joseph was going to provide a lineage for Jake, Joseph, I mean for Jacob. But God used the means. He used the means of his capture and the bitterness of his brothers. God decreed that the Son of God was going to come and save men from their sins. But God used it, which means he used the means of his crucifixion. Now, this is what I think blew my mind. I hope it blesses you also. God has decreed. The redemption of humanity. God has decreed the salvation of some. And what did God do? God used the means. The means was the coming of his holy son. Upon the earth to die. To rise again and bring redemption to humanity. Okay. So the same God who decrees something to happen also provides the means. The means could be good, it could be bad. Amen. In all of these things, we see the outworking of the sovereignty of God. I hope I've not spent too much time. I think I've gone about 33 minutes or 43. Let me just, I don't know. Uh, Adeniji, can I can I round up now or you can take a, a few more? I just have two more points. Oh, I wish you round up now because of that. Uh, some questions that people might have, and people also oh, have right. to do some other things. So we'll okay. continue tomorrow. Sir. All right. So, okay. So um, I still have God's sovereignty and salvation, and I want to round up with the wisdom of God. So by God's grace, I'm going to look at that. So by all means, that is what the sovereignty of God means. God, the sovereignty of God is basically saying that God Himself is working out all purple. God has decreed things to happen. God provides the means for those things to happen. Amen. So that's my discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so right now the floor is open. Is any question to ask? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, please, yeah. okay uh, who is speaking? Yeah, please, Tomiwa. Okay, Tomiwa, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, I thank you very much for the um, detailed explanation. So, um, my question is, based on the case of evil you mentioned, yes. um, you know, originally what we read in the Genesis is man, God created man, and everything he created were all good. Everything were good. So, if God doesn't decree those evils, those, those evil things that men do, how does the heart come into the man, the men, and even angels like Lucifer, the heart of rebellious? How does, 
how does it come if it is not in a sovereignty way to do that? Okay. So that's uh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try as much as possible to say that, uh, first of all, I had quoted Isaiah, where I said that um, God creates darkness, he creates light. I also quoted um, uh, the fact that um, is there, if there's calamity, God is there. If there's peace, God is the one. Okay, God decrees all of these things to happen. Okay, uh, it's difficult for me to be able to say it this way, but I believe that we um, is something that even theologians will agree with. But God actually decreed the fall. God decreed the, the fall of the angels. God decreed the fall of man. God decreed all of those things. Okay, how did evil come to into the heart of man for man to do those things? The answer is in the confessions that God is not the author of evil, okay? And God is not the author of evil because of God's attributes, all right? And one of the things I didn't say about the attributes of God is that when we say the attributes of God, we're not saying that God, one part of him is love, one part is light, one part is uh, uh, unsearchable, one part is uh, omniscient. What? No, when we say that God is love, the whole entirety of God can be seen as love. When we say that God is omniscient, the whole of God is omniscient. Okay. Now, this is where to answer. This is why I believe that God is not author of evil and could not have put evil in the heart of men, even though he used it to bring about his decrees. Okay. It is this God is just, God is righteous. Okay, there is no sin in God. There is no sin in, in, in God. There is no unrighteousness in him. Those are some of his attributes. Okay, if there is no sin in God and there is no unrighteousness in him, then the source of evil could not have come from God. Okay, the source of evil comes from man. The source of evil comes from uh, the fallen man, from Adam. The source of evil came from Eve. The source of evil came from the angels from Lucifer, okay? But God used all of that to bring his purposes to pass. That is what I'm trying to teach. I, I'm not sure whether I answered that question. Yes, sir. Uh, but but, but uh, maybe tomorrow, but I'm not 100% satisfied, sir. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, maybe we'll just leave uh, open for another question. If we don't have any other question, we'll take your own question. Okay, sir, I actually have a question. Okay, uh, I can't hear you very well, my mother. Rachel, you may have to speak close out. Okay, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Just go ahead. Okay, my question is this. In the sovereignty of God, is it that God determines just the outcome or the final result or that God um, determines every step that leads to the final result. Like for instance now, let's say it has been decreed that Jesus has to be killed. But is it that it has also been ordained that Judas has to be the one to betray Jesus or that the betrayal has to happen on a particular day or at a particular moment? So that's what I want to understand. So is it that God leaves some things open to us and he just determines the outcome? Or he just he determines the outcome and all the steps that lead to the outcome? Okay, I, I'm going to say that God determines the outcome and all the events that leads to the outcome. And I'm going to quote the uh, fathers again who said, God has decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably all things which shall ever come to pass so god has decreed even the, the means to it okay, so, um, at the same time god is not the author okay. of evil okay, so that's to say that for everything that god wants to do there is very like a particular verse chosen to do it Sorry, I didn't hear you. Like, I'm trying to say, does that mean that for everything God wants to take him, when it comes to man, anything God wants to do, there's a particular vessel that God has chosen to do that job? 
Yes, I, I believe so. Uh, yes. Um, the, the fact remains that um, the Son of Man, that is Jesus, was going to be betrayed. And I believe that based on the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, God actually ordained that Judas was going to be the man to betray Jesus. It wasn't just that somebody would betray him. Judas was, you know. But at the same time, God was not the author of the evil that led him to that path. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, tomorrow, by God's grace, I will look at some application. But uh, I've not been able to finish uh, the concept of the sovereignty of God in salvation, which is more controversial, more controversial, you know, but at least we've been able to do some justice to this whole concept of the fact of God's decrees. It, it's something we must accept. It's something that is written in scripture. God has decreed all things that we ever come to pass. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Um, please, is there anyone that has any, any other question? Okay, can the earlier person speak? Okay, go ahead. Oh, I think I don't think anybody will have any other question. So we can just. Continue. Yeah, so you just shoot, please. Okay, so in the absence of any other question, I'd like to appreciate our lecturer for his time. And for carefully Thank you. Light and giving us that wonderful lecture. We hope that you also join us tomorrow to be having a lecture with you. So I think that's a wrap for today. We join the call tomorrow. Okay, so by God's grace, tomorrow at 8 30, we'll join up again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Adeniki. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will. We can hear you. Please speak louder. Okay, closing prayer so we can round off the program. All right. Holy Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this word of grace that you speak to us. Thank you for making us to know that you are so very noble of creation. Thank you that you are God that controls the whole universe. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you are God of heaven and earth. Thank you that all things are in your control. So, and even this is the only pillow your children can raise their head on. We appreciate you for what you have done. And we pray that that you continue to bless speaker for you to strengthen the speaker we can't hear you again oh I think you know talk let's just say amen, amen. <laughs> amen. amen. Yeah. Okay, it does it. It's by your network. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I need you to please um, uh, well, maybe by the time we're done with it, or I'd like to have the video. Please. Okay, no problem. Baby God can just please um, save the video okay. now, and he will send it to you. Okay. Whoa, oh, oh, that would be wonderful. Right. Okay. So you can please good night. Good, good night, sir. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. <laughs>